Great, so welcome everybody to the Institute of Environmental Futures lecture series. Um, welcome to everyone in the room, it's a good turnout today and also to everybody online. So we're very happy to welcome Dr Samuel, our very own Dr Samuel Kai from the University of Leicester. Um, Samuel was medically trained in preventative medicine uh, in China and then went on to study epidemiology and for his PhD specifically environmental epidemiology okay. from Imperial College okay. London. Okay. And then he went on to do postdoctoral research at Imperial and also the University of Oxford, okay. focusing on air pollution, epidemiological studies in the UK, China okay. and Africa. So pretty okay. broad. Um, he joined the Centre for Environmental Health and Sustainability okay. at the University of Leicester in 2021. And his research focuses on broader environmental determinants, uh, air and noise pollution, urban built environments, climate factors. So again, lots of really interesting things that are relevant to the Institute um, on population and patient health in both high income and low and middle income countries. So we're very happy to welcome Samuel here today. And he's going to give us a talk on climate change, heat, air quality and human health. And over to you, Samuel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marla, for this very nice introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, to join today and also join online. Uh, so today, I'm very it's a great honor for me uh, to present here. Thanks for, for the invitations. Um, so my talk will be under the theme of climate change. Um, so I will really would like to talk about the heat and air quality because I come from a health research background. So this talk is largely around the health impacts of heat and quality um, in the studies that in recent years that we have found. So we, in the last decade or so, we have talked about so much about climate change. So what really is climate change? So in technical terms, climate change refers to uh, large scale, long-term shifts in average temperature and weather patterns. So um, it, it could happen naturally, for example, the, the uh, eruption of the panel, but largely since mid 1800s or since industrial revolution, is human activities has been the main driver of causing climate change by producing what we, what we call now the greenhouse gases like um, carbon uh, dioxide or also the methane. So these greenhouse gases literally act like a, a blanket right around our Earth. So basically, they trap the, they trap the sun's heat around the Earth and raise the temperature overall. And from the graph here, you can see um, is the, the global mean temperature from, 19, from 1850 up until 2022. So we can see our globe, our, our Earth is actually uh, warming up, particularly since the year 2000s, and even so, in the last decade, we can see it's rise quite rapidly. I think we are now at a temperature which is around 1.2 Celsius degree warmer than the pre-industrial level, and it's actually not far to the 1.5 Celsius degree tipping point, or the so-called tipping point that, you know, it's widely believed that if we pass that threshold, there will be huge consequences not only to our Earth, but also to our health as well. So where are these uh, human-made greenhouse gases uh, are from? So from this IPCC report, it shows that up to around 25% actually has come from the burning of fossil fuels <coughs> for generation of electricity and also heat production. That's quite a big a sector uh, generating this um, greenhouse gases. Another trend, 25% actually come from the uh, agricultural, forestry, and other land use. We know that um, in some areas, people might have chosen to chop out um, large areas of forest or woodland and turn that into a farmland. And we know that forest is very good at absorbing CO2 overall. And also the, the farm animals themselves are also producing gases like methane. So these are very big sector contributing to the uh, greenhouse gas emission. And other sources also include like a building, for example, the production of cement, and also the transport sector. Particularly, we talk quite a lot about the carbon footprint by the aeroplane industry. And of course, this industry 
also contributes a lot in terms of the emission, uh, greenhouse gas emission overall contributing to around 21%. So collectively, all these sources have contributed to the ever-growing greenhouse gas emission around the world that we have seen today. So assuming there's no actions taken, our world's just getting warm up year by year. And it could be on a point that it is have a huge have a negative impact on the earth and also on our health. So if you follow the weather events um, around the world this year, you might be quite impressed at what could uh, climate change cause to our could cause to our earth. So this July was actually the, the highest, the, the hottest on record on a global level. So I know it is quite mild here in England, but in Europe, in US, and also in China, where I spent my summer this year, it was really record-breaking, the temperature. And also in Somalia, in March this year, there's an ongoing drought, which is, uh, many people without access to food or clean water. And in June, I'm sure you have watched this from the news, it's orange sky all over the news in June this year, is, it was actually the, the fire smoke um, come from hundreds of mile, miles away in Canada. And in Hawaii, uh, in August this year, they have um, the most deadliest wildfire in US history. So you, have, you might possibly never saw this image before, you know, for New York and Hawaii. So it was quite a shock. And also around the same period in early September, there was a huge flooding in Libya. So literally destroying a, a one quarter of the city in, the, in one of the Libyan city. And around the same time, uh, Hong Kong, they also recorded the record breaking rainfalls overnight since their record began in the 1800s. So really climate change is not only about temperature rise. Temperature rise is only about the beginning of the story because our Earth is a giant uh, ecosystem, so it will affect everything. So we will see lots of heat waves uh, or jowls, and then we have uh, flooding here in, in England, we've seen as well. And also we have severe storms or cyclones, and also um, the data has already been recorded around the, the declining biodiversity and also the prolonged uh, pollen seasons. So these are, these factors are really impacting our health to to different degree. So climate change, um, so climate crisis basically is a health crisis. It impacts our health either directly or indirectly. So obviously, it directly impacts on environmental factors. You know, threatening the some of the essential ingredients of good health like clean air, safe drinking water, nutrition food, and also safe housing or shelter but it also undermines some social determinants of good health. For example, the livelihood, um, equality and access to healthcare, social support structures. So I'm sure you have, might have heard about the uh, climate migration, which is you know, people displaced by the climate and have to force to move to somewhere else. So it is not only about the environment, it's really about the livelihoods, about people's jobs and their communities and their justice as well. So unfortunately, these health risks are disproportionately felt by the most vulnerable and the disadvantaged groups around the world currently. If you just seen the picture in Libya and Hong Kong, so you find a massive uh, difference in terms of resilience to the flooding, where in Libya, it could destroy over one quarter of the city and many people has lost their homes and lives. So climate change is a real threat. Um, to undermine decades of progress in, in global health, and particularly so in low and middle income countries. So all these factors um, collectively, they all increase our vulnerability to climate change. And, and also the health impact of climate change could be wide ranging. It could, you know, it could range from injury or respiratory illness and also mental health all the way down. So, uh, in the medium to short term, our one, so the health impact of climate change depends on really three factors. So one is um, vulnerability, and the other one is the our resilience, particularly the, the health system capacity, how to deal with this climate crisis, and also the pace of adaptation or mitigation. But in the long term, 
the health impact of climate change really depends on how far we go in terms of the overall emission reduction. And that really requires very bold and rapid uh, policy action around the governments all over the world. So in this talk, um, or in the following slide, I, I will mention one of the most sensitive, uh, climate sensitive health outcomes, which is heat related illness um, for this seminar. So before that, I would like to uh, just introduction about the recent trends in our, in our weather. So we are living in a country really much enjoy talking about the weather. And, and I think some more of you slightly, if you live in UK, you, you will feel slowly year by year, the, the temperature just get warmer and warmer. And also, and this uh, figure on the left shows them actually the 10 hottest year in UK history have been recorded since year 2002. It was slightly outdated of this figure. I think the 2019 and 2022 are another record-breaking years uh, in terms of the temperature in the UK. And last year, for the very first time, we have recorded over 40 Celsius degree. And this is quite an alarming figure. Um, UK is definitely not prepared to this level of high temperature. And the figure on the right showing the percentage of days with very strong heat stress, that means um, the amb ambient temperature around 38 to 46 degrees, which is very high in Southern European countries from 1950 to 2022. And again, you can see roughly since year 2000, the 5% uh, of days or even sometimes 7% of days in the summer months has been met. And this is quite intense in terms of this extremely hot weather, particularly so in the last 10 years, is sometimes it could even hit to the 7.5% of days in the summer with very strong heat stress in this um, southern countries. So these data are all telling us you know, from UK, Europe, or somewhere else across the world, that's record-breaking temperature. It is becoming more frequent and also more intense and tends to last slightly longer. So how are humans going to deal with this heat stress? In the so physiologically, there are two primary ways. One is through the device of dilation, which is basically um, about the redistribution of the blood flow from the muscle to the skin and then to the external environment. So in order for the body to efficiently do that, our heart has to pump really faster and also harder to get the blood flow moving uh, as far as it can to, to distribute the heat to the outside. And so that's why it is really particularly dangerous for those people who already have existing heart disease. And also in epidemiological study, there's a strong association between heat stress and cardiovascular events, whether it might be a hospitalization or even death sometimes. And because of the redistributing of the blood towards the skin, there's increased level of oxidative stress throughout the body. And this increased level of oxidative stress might destroy our cell or tissue and organ, which might have a, health, a huge health implication on other organ systems as well, including our lungs. And another pathway that people deal with heat is through the direct sweating. And as we all know, if left untended for a long period, it might lead to dehydration. And we put extra uh, pressures on our heart and also particularly on the kidney as well. So in the worst case, it could lead to acute acute kidney failure. So these are very um, uh, severe health consequences in terms of the heat stress. But of course, you know, individual respond to the uh, heat stress quite differently. Particularly for older people, they are not uh, quite as good as young people to deal with the acute changes of temperature, but also, but also because they have some existing uh, long-term health condition, particularly for cardiovascular disease or respiratory disease. And or they might take some medication that might impact their ability to control the body's temperature and or the sweating. So older people are particularly vulnerable in this, in this sense. And another subgroup which of great concern about the health impacts from peace stress is those people with reduced behavioral capability. And for example, people who are confined to their bed, who are people who are living alone, or they need someone to care uh, for both who are unable to care for oneself basically, or people who are have 
the inference about alcohol or people who have some uh, mental health condition. So these are the people are particularly vulnerable as well. So that's why the any heat health action plan should pay extra attention or targeting these people in order to avoid some unnecessary uh, illness or, or human life loss. <clears throat> So in the next few slides, I'm going to present some, uh, some recent study just coming out in recent months uh, in the literature. So this is a, a GMD modeling study, which is the global burden of disease modeling study. It's actually the first uh, global cost specific burden estimate from uh, temperature. So what they found is interesting, right? In 2019, they overall, they modeled that around 1.7 million deaths worldwide were linked to the extreme cold and heat. And among this, uh, around 356,000 were related to heat. So I think two key messages here. One is um, overall at a global level, um, heat related, uh, the temperature related mortality is still largely uh, dominated by the cold weather events, but they do find a very steady increase in terms of the risks from very high temperature. And secondly, what they found is the, the highest heat uh, attributable burdens were observed in those areas like uh, South and Southeast Asia, sub saharan Africa, and also North Africa and Middle East. These areas, they already have some um, high prevailing ambient temperature, and they found this area had the highest heat attributable burdens of the temperature. So overall, this study found that you know, temperature is definitely a relevant risk factor for human health. Um, and it's also, this kind of study is very valuable in terms of informing uh, public health policy making, but also informing uh, future temperature and health scenarios. It is a model, so of course, model comes to a lot of uncertainties and assumptions, but I think it's really providing a very strong case is that temperature, it is a real, a real risk factor for human health to begin with. And I also want to highlight this study, which is the, uh, the multi-country, multi-city collaborative research network, the MCC research network, which is led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine down in London. So this study, they have collected data from 620 cities from 36 countries get the data from the ground level monitoring station on air pollution or temperature, and also the deaths of, uh, the, the counts of deaths in each city from this country. So the this, this study period ranging from 1995 to 2020, so it's, it's around 25 years long study, but of course it varied by location. And they analyzed this data set, you know, in one to six months uh, in a year. So they did two steps. So first, they run a city-specific time series analysis, which to look at the association between day-to-day -day association of the variation of temperature and the counts of deaths in that specific city. And then after the, this first step, they put all the cities data together to perform that analysis to basically to get an overall health risk estimate of the uh, heat-related mortality. So overall, as I in the red box here, they found about a 9% increase of mortality if the, if the air temperature increased from the 75 uh, percentage to 99 percentage. So you might think this might be quite a small trend, right? It's more than 9%, but at a population level, it, is a, it has a huge public health impact. So it is a time series study. Um, it's a time series study. What, we, what, what they found is, um, it is, so it provides very good research framework for global collaboration in this kind of study. So let's zoom in now a little bit more about what happened last year in Europe, the European 2022 heat wave. So these studies was uh, actually quite tiny and it's just published in July this year. And they look at the data across all the European countries and the figure on the left hand side showing the average summer temperature every year from 1990 to 2020. As you can see, there's a steady increase from 1990 up until, I think, 2011 or 12, except for the 2003 heat wave. I'm sure maybe some of you still have the memory of the 2003 European heat wave. And then suddenly there's a step change uh, 
roughly around the year 2012 or 2013, there's a very rapid increase in terms of the summer average temperature in Europe. And last year was another record-breaking year of the heat wave, 2022 European heat wave. So the, the, the official team did look in more detail in, in terms of what happened in the last 10, 10 years in the figure on the right. So, so they calculate the number of deaths that are potentially related to this extreme heat in European countries. And again, they found the year in 2022, the number of deaths were, was particularly high, they estimated around 61,000 61, deaths that could be attributed to extreme heat in only three months uh, period in summer last year. So again, the South European country are very vulnerable to this uh, extreme heat events. Uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, and Portugal. So these four countries have the highest heat-related mortality rates per million people, particularly for, so for, it for Italy and Greece. So again, this, this last few slides, is basically collectively telling us that you know, heat wave can kill um, it is becoming more intense, more frequent. But let's see what would the future look like if we continue the business as usual. Oh, we also, you also mentioned that the heat will become more often or more intense. How often would that be? So this is um, a very, very good study or very delicate modeling study, basically to answer that, that question. You know, how often would that be in terms of the heat wave? So they, we just take an example here, for example, in Paris, in 2003 heat wave. So the heat related deaths in Paris accounted for almost 6% of all deaths in 2003 in, in that heat wave alone. So under that 2000 climate, you know, by that time, it's just the warming level is about 0.7 Celsius degree warmer than the pre-industrial level. It is predicted that this, this event or this mandatory event will only happen one in 100 years for once. And now we are under the 2020 climate. We are now actually 1.2 Celsius degree warmer than pre-industrial level. And actually the heat that event at this magnitude, as the model predicted, will be expected every 10 to 20 years, as you can see in figure eight here. And that's exactly what we have seen, you know, the heat wave this year and also the heat wave last year as compared to the last major heat wave in 2003. It seems we are right on track in this way. So if the world continues the business as usual, assuming no adaptation has occurred, no mitigation whatsoever, we are heading to the warming level of 1.5 Celsius degree, which is the bigger base here, and, uh, and even two Celsius degree, which is the bigger C here. They expect this kind of event will be very commonplace. It just it will happen repeatedly every few other years. It could be two or three years in the worst case. So, so this is a very, very compelling uh, modeling study or compelling story telling us that mitigation or adaptation is really needed in the very near future to stop the temperature rise even further, because that will save potentially millions of people's lives across the world. So this really nice study um, telling us what would the future look like. So I, I think since we are talking about the heat here, I, I think we can't go away without mentioning the Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is quite common, so it's becoming uh, hugely frequency, uh, frequent in size or also severity globally. Um, so Wi-Fi, why is it dangerous? So first of all, the fire itself could cause bodily harm, but the smoke is even more concerning because when it burns down vegetation, it releases large amounts of uh, particles and also uh, carbon dioxide and um, carbon monoxide as it's burned down the vegetation. But it, it not only spent down vegetation, it also burned down people's house, people's uh, car, and every content inside the house. That means the, the, um, the air that is particularly more toxic, the, the fire smoke is particularly more toxic because it contains many different chemicals in the air because of the Wi-Fi. And what makes it even worse is that the, the fire smoke, they can travel very long distance. So it's not only affecting the communities of people living around the fire, but it can impact people population far, far away. So that is particularly, particularly dangerous. Um, so I just show you the picture in New York in June this year. It was actually the fire smoke uh, from Canada. Um, 
which are hundreds of miles away, and the fire smoke blows away toward down, all the way to south, southward to uh, towards New York City. It's actually um, so only so uh, this fire smoke actually has been uh, recorded by all the air air quality monitors across all boroughs in New York City. So um, Dr. Chen, uh, based at uh, University of uh, Yale, um, so he has done this rapid analysis. He he shows this in his analysis. He shows that the average PM two point five increased rapidly overnight from around ten microgram per cubic meter up to one hundred fifty microgram per cubic meter just overnight. And over that space of two days, sixth um, and eighth June, there's around forty four percent increase in, in terms of the hospital admission that people turn us at the emergency room with asthma condition that need um, uh, care from the hospital. So. It is very serious health impact, as we can see here from the wildfire. It, it, it could cause very acute respiratory symptom, even though the original fire spot uh, is 100 miles away. So what we know about the health impacts of wildfire. So we know there's some acute health impacts. For example, there will be, um, particularly so for the, uh, for the respiratory system, you have Increased respiratory mobility, including the infections, uh, respiratory infection, asthma, and also uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, or COPD in short, and also mortality. So these short-term study, time series study, they are still very useful to uh, inform people how to respond to the Wi-Fi smoke, at least in the very short period. But what we really need to understand, or, or currently the research in this extremely understudies about the long-term health impacts of wildfire, if wildfire is going to be, become more common, more severe uh, globally across the world. So we do need some research on um, respiratory disease, CVD, um, cardiovascular disease, and also mental health is particularly needed. And this is particularly relevant for uh, communities you know, who are facing repeated exposure to high concentration of wildfire related PM2.5, year by year. So this is a real concern for them. So we need to understand better about what would be the long-term health impacts to these communities. So not long ago, I, I was part of a study team to look at the, at the landscape fire smoke, uh, how that impact the association between PN exposures and acute respiratory infection among children, very young children under five years of age from 48 middle, low middle income countries. So previously all these Similar study they were conducted in high income countries, and I think this is one of the very first study that specifically looking at the LMIC populations. So what we found was really quite interesting. Uh, we found that although fire source PN two point five actually only account around twelve percent of the total PN two point five, it actually has a much larger health impact, as you can see from the, the dose response relationship, uh, the gray curves here. It is much uh, the health impact was much larger than the non-fire source PM two point five, and I think this is uh, could be explained because as I just mentioned, fire source PM two point five could be more toxic than the non-fire source PM two point five. Particularly when we talk about landscape fire smoke here, it it can uh, induce many high carbonaceous particles and also with huge oxidative potential and also abundance of free radical which is particularly relevant for our respiratory system is an irritation of our respiratory airways. So I'm not surprised to, to found this um, a conclusion. What I need to mention is when we spoke to landscape fire smoke here, it's not necessarily means that we talk about wildfire smoke. So actually landscape fire smoke in these 48 countries, they all are related to human activities. For example, the farmers, uh, do some deforestation or burning down the agricultural waste or clear the land using fire for farming. So these kind of activities are already relatively uh, related to their lower social economy status. And also don't forget that these people already suffering from very high incidence of acute respiratory infection of these young children. So they already suffer. So we do need to protect them even more in terms of the environmental policy. You know, how we can better support them, for example, provide some technical solution for them to reduce their reliance on fire for the, the farmland management, uh, which, which is a good uh, 
way forward, we should be able to do that to protect people's health or to adjust at least part of the environment to adjust the issues here. So it's, it's, it's a very nice study. If you're interested, you can have a read uh, afterwards. So, so um, just how impacts of heat in a nutshell, I just talked a little bit about the, the how impacts of heat, particularly the direct impact, talk about the heat illness. Um, also, it could be cause mortality, uh, particularly from respiratory and cardiovascular, and also hospitalization. But there's some indirect impacts, for example, the impacts on health service uh, capacity, the increased risk of the accident, you know, a drowning, or as a, particularly for people working outdoor, and also increased transmission of infectious diseases like dengue uh, outbreak in somewhere, particularly in Southeast Asia, and also potential disruption of infrastructure, power cut, people might uh, switch to air conditioning, for example, and result in a power cut. Uh, unexpectedly. And of course, there's some vulnerable group in our society that we need to pay extra attention to that I mentioned already, already. So like children, elderly, um, poor people, people with some disability, and also people working outdoor, which is a particularly vulnerable group in terms of the occupation of health in the heat. So I mentioned quite a lot about heat and health, and this is largely related to the outdoor high temperature. What we really don't know too much is about the high indoor temperature. There's a very nice review study um, just published recently. They, uh, they've identified around 20 studies or so, and they found that the high indoor temperature affects human health with the stronger evidence for respiratory health, diabetes management, and also dementia symptoms. And this area of research is still growing and the evidence is still relatively weak as compared to outdoor temperature. And it's particularly so for, um, particularly during the periods of heat where we want to know how do people cope with that, you know, but particularly for people with long-term health condition and people who are resident of nursing home, you know, what advice should, should we be given to these people and their carer? Particularly for some British homes, they are not built, they are built for actually to keep the heat in, not keep the heat out, which built like 100 years ago. So we do need some advice to advise these people if they live in this housing, what, what you could do during the, during the hot weather. So I'm very pleased that we have a PhD student and he just um, started working in this area of research funded by the IEF F50 PhD studentship. And he will look into this uh, relationship, hopefully to find out what would be the optimal temperature that we could advise to people uh, if they can find to the indoor home, particularly in the hot weather, and we also want to know, you know, what strategy they can they can take to reduce the risks or at least to minimize this kind of risks. So it would be a quite nice study. I'm hoping in the next two to three years we have more data to share with you and the wider scientific community. So the next part of my seminar, because I work on uh, air pollution and health quite a while now, um, I always want to know what would be the effects of co-exposure to high temperature and also air pollution. You know, would that be a double trouble? And actually, lots of study already showing that this could be a really double trouble or double killer, uh, in a sense. So before that, I I'm not sure how many of you already know the health impacts of air pollution, but the health impacts of air pollution are really wide ranging. Now, it, initially, all the study focused on the heart and lung. But in the last decade or so, lots of us studies coming out in the, in the literature showing that the particle and gases can also reach almost every part of our body. It could affect our brain and our liver, kidney, and also our bones or even the placenta. So it is wide ranging, it's not only affecting our heart and lungs, though. So, and also it could affect every life stage uh, from those unborn to the very old age. So the main mechanism of the air pollution health effects is by the status stress. And basically it's the generation of it, a free radical and which will go on to damage the cell and tissue and also organ. And therefore it gives some short and long-term health impacts, which sounds very familiar that I just mentioned earlier about the heat stress, about the redistribution of the blood flow toward the skin. So they quite a uh, little bit overlap in terms of biological mechanism. And some common filters here 
what we, what we found in the scientific literature is about PN10, PN course, uh, PN25, which is a fine particle can travel deep down into up to the lung and then to the bloodstream and also ultraviolet particle, some gas particle and NOx and nitrogen dioxide, and also the volatile organic compound, VOCs, ozone is actually created during the chemical reaction in the atmosphere. So what happened in air to air quality during heat spray? Um, so this is a figure that was taken last year in Greenwich Park. It's, it's in London, so usually it's is an open, you know, grassy open spaces, but last year it became quite dusty, potentially highly inflammable, and, and you could look at the sky, quite murky, which is just suggest the air quality was not at its optimal. So the, the UK National Centre for Atmospheric Science, which based at uh, York and Manchester, they, they did a rapid analysis to basically go out to collect the, uh, the air samples during the heat wave last year. And what they found was quite interesting. They have basically had three conclusions. So first of all, they found the, the ground level ozone concentration is, was actually quite high, the injury is high, but particularly in London and Southeast area. And I think this is not surprising because we know ozone is actually directly, is formed under the direct sunlight with its precursor, particularly the, the NO2, NOx, and the VOCs. And also because of the heat wave, the air moves quite slow. It actually enables the buildup of this precursor of ozone. And because of the, the heat wave, again, there will be faster evaporation and which uh, the, the emission rates of VOC will increase again. So the precursors build up, and that's why we have seen quite a high concentration of ozone during the heat wave. And we know that ozone is particularly harmful for respiration health as well. The second conclusion that they found was that, you know, PM was mostly made up of organic material. Again, this could be more toxic, and what they, what they suggest, like, they might be come from a local fire or or regional wildfire from European countries, but more likely that because the heat is so strong, it basically cook up all the chemicals in the air to form some new organic material, which suggesting this PN during the heat wave could be quite toxic as well. And the last conclusion they found is they found very high numbers of larger coarse pollution particles, which suggests that this is the dust from the ground. Again, it's not Pricing because we know in heat wave is quite dry and then the dust particle is could be quite common and expected. So this, this national analysis telling us that air quality during heat wave is not that great. Um, so potentially, if you could imagine air quality, air pollution, heat wave goes hand in hand, it could um, affect people health more badly. So what is the scientific evidence? So I keep going back to this NCC research network because it, they got a huge um, database around the world from 600, from over 600 cities. So if you look at the, the graph on your left-hand side, it is basically showing the, the, temp the temperature effects on mortality under different level of air pollution. So if you can see, as the air pollution level increase, PM10, PM2.5, ozone, and MO2, the, the relationship between heat and mortality also become generally stronger. That means more higher pollution and then the heat will have a more severe impact on mortality. And on your right hand side is looking at the, uh, the air pollution effects on mortality under different temperature thresholds. So for PM10, PM2.5 and ozone, up until like 18 or 80 percentage, it's changed a little, very little. But from 80% of temp air temperature onwards up until 90 or 199, you can see that the association become very strong. And that which basically suggests the air pollution or mortalities is the strongest when it is on hottest days. So clearly this evidence uh, showing some effects modification between air temperature and air pollutants or mortality during this warm period in this global data set, there's some effect modification here between these two. There's another study which I would really quite like to highlight is the Californian study. So California, as we know, sometimes from time to time, is also an epicenter of high temperature or, or wildfires. 
So according to that data, compared to the climate 50, 50 years ago, the average summer temperature has increased progressively by around 1.5 Celsius degree, and the Wi-Fi has increased almost fivefold compared to 50 years ago. So, and we also know California is, you know, is also famous for sometimes air pollution episode as well. So making a very a great urban lab to study the interaction between the two. So they look at these extreme heats and air pollution. They collect all the deaths from 2014 to 2019. So for each death, based on the date of the death, they assign to one of these four structural exposure. There could be days with only extreme PM2.5 or days with only extreme temperature or days with both extreme exposure or days with no extreme, which serve as a reference group here. So you see the upper panel of this uh, figure. So if they're only exposure to extreme temperature, for example, over 99 percentage, there's around 5% increase in deaths if you're only exposed to extreme temperature. And if you're only exposed to extreme PM2.5, again, for example, about, about 99 percentage, it could be 4% increased risk in death. However, if you're exposed to both extreme temperature and both extreme PM2.5 up to 99 percentage, the risk of that could be increased by 17 percent. That is a huge increase and it's even larger than the individual risk sum up, which kind of suggests this is, could be a synergistic, uh, synergistic interaction between the two, uh, both extreme heat and air pollution. So it is a very, very strong study telling us that this is a deadly combination, extreme heat and air pollution. And we do need some very strong public health policy during this extreme weather events to avoid very unnecessary loss of life and illness. <clears throat> so there's a quite um, a recent review looking at specific this topic, uh, very detailed, very, very up to date. If you're interested, I would suggest you have a read. But basically, the key messages of this review coming out is that there seems to have a sufficient evidence for synergistic or cause mortality, particularly also for cardiovascular and respiratory effects of air pollution and heat, and particularly so very obvious for ozone and particular matter that I just mentioned why this might be the case. And what they call for more research is the other course of other course specific outcomes uh, studies. Again, they summarize what's the limitation of this kind of study. They are all short-term studies. I mean, we are really not sure about the long-term health impacts. And also the exposure assessment is not accurate. It's not as accurate as we might expect it. So the, for example, they're not assigned at individual level. They just extract data from the regional monitor, uh, maybe far away from people exposures and so on. So there's some a bit of an um, exposure error that you might expect and that might impact the accuracy of the health effect estimates, which they call on future study to address at least some of this issue. So by far, I think you're already very tired that I don't buckle you also at the much study. So you might want to ask what are the solution or, or is there anything we can do? So if you look at this um, Lancet article, which is published a few years ago, they actually list very, very detailed intervention strategy or cooling strategy based on three different levels, the, the landscape or urban level, building level, and also individual level. However, I think we do need some good evidence to see how cost effective they are, you know, to what extent that they could protect our health or, or avoid the deaths. So that's why the key message number one is that we need very evidence-based, well-tested cooling strategy during this extreme uh, hot weather to, to see how effective they are. And that's my the intervention study coming into play. And the second message is about the, the use of air conditioning, which is still debated because it might still contribute to the greenhouse gas emission, although to a lesser extent, but it might uh, raise another environmental justice issue because it is quite unaffordable for many, for many of the most vulnerable financially or also environmentally costly. So it is still a debating whether air conditioning should be encouraged to use or not during hot weather. And then the carry on the third message is about at a population level, what intervention we could offer, for example, to, to do some landscape planning, building more blue or green spaces to green down the environment, 
And that is really important because if you don't have a population level, there's a huge public health impact. And for individual level, what they suggest is we should not focus on cooling the surrounding environment of the individual, but really to focus on the person to relieve the heat stress from their body. Um, that's just a lot of way that you, you can have a look. So finally, what the key message is, the heat action plan should be robust. I think also should be really health focused, evident-based, and also well communicated, you know, before the heat wave is hitting towards and should be informed by real-time uh, surveillance data to provide the optimal health protection overall for our populations. So since I just mentioned about the intervention at urban or, or urban or building scale, so there's a very nice study coming out from Lancet Planet Health recently about, it's a modeling study. So basically they look at 93 European cities, they look at year 2015, look at the summer months, and they found that the urban heat island effects increased the mean city temperature by 1.5 Celsius degree. And this increase resulted in about 67,000 deaths overall. So the study team looked at that. How about if we model, we increase the tree coverage to around 30% in each of the city, and what would that result in temperature? And what they found in their model, they found this actually cooled down the city by a means of 0.4 Celsius degree which seems a very gentle reduction. But again, this has a huge public health implication. It could you know, avoid 20, 2,600 deaths uh, could be prevented, which is up to 39% reduction if you compare to 2015 baseline. So it does, it seems work. I mean, if we go for a greener city in the future, this might at least help mitigate part of the climate uh, effect if that is inevitable that we're heading to. So my final summary, um, climate change is, the, as, as I said, climate crisis is a health crisis. It's potentially the great health challenges of our century. And extreme hot weather is becoming more frequent, intense. So we need some really urgent mitigation and, and adaptations now. Even if we take it now, the, you know, the health impact will still see very um, highly disrupted weather events in the last decade, but we need to study the mitigation of that issue now. There's a very compelling evidence linking excessive heat and premature mortality across the global uh, community. And again, air pollution, extreme high temperature, exogenously, so leading to a very stronger and more negative health responses overall. There's some options available regarding urban intervention and groups for to manage the extreme heat from the urban design level to building level or even to individual level. However, we need to assess the, the long-term health benefits of this intervention or how cost effective they are to suggest for uh, policymaking people. And that will be, I'm hoping we can see lots of intervention study in the future in this area. So thank you very much to, for attending today. Um, thank you. That was marvellous. Thank you so much, Samuel. I think what struck me, well, sorry, <laughs> what struck me was that it's always the most vulnerable, isn't it? Yes. Suffer, uh, whether that's at a global scale or a, a regional scale. So, yeah. Um, we can open the floor for questions. We've got uh, about 10 minutes um, or so. So I've got a question while people just ponder for a moment. Uh, you talked about respiratory issues and also uh, heat but what about cancer I kept thinking what about skin cancer for example uh, is that part of are there any big studies on that as well uh, yeah please, please. yeah that's a really good point so generally environmental ecology studies still particularly for the cancer outcome is really understudied but specifically for the skin cancer I think there's some very good evidence now particularly for the UV light when people are exposed to to the summer during heat wave or during summer, normal summer. And there's some evidence to suggest that there must be a link to skin cancer as well. But for other types of cancer, I think it's still extremely less studied at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any questions in the, in the room? Yeah, I'd like to know more about the humidity of the air because uh, I don't know if um, took into account 
that the humidity of the air in terms of considering different locations of the, the globe. So in tropical regions, uh, by the map you showed, uh, there is not a huge amount of death to do to, 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 to heat waves. And if you consider the south of Europe, have a lot of death related to this problem. And the main different aspects I, I can see is the humidity of the air. So we can talk a lot more about so you're basically asking me what's the regional difference between different heat weather or weather related mortality. Yeah. So I think there's quite um, a difference. First of all, the population structure might be quite different and sensitive to the heat weather might be different. And also the health capacity, the health system is also quite different. And I think um, so actually what they in their original report is also found this northern European countries are also getting towards what we will see in the southern European countries as well, if we continue that way. So it's just a gradual increase. But because um, in southern European countries, they already suffer this kind of hot weather. And I think their population structure is slightly different from the other countries as well. Just leading on from that, wouldn't humidity have an impact on sweating? Because if it's you know, if you have like a 95% humidity, then you're not able to. So are there any studies that link, that also include like humidity apart from heat? Yes, I didn't measure humidity, but lots of these studies uh, regarding the temperature and health study, they already adjusted the humidity in their model. So this already considered, I think almost every study has considered humidity. But there's a slightly nice review in the journal, European, you know, the environmental health perspective specifically look at the interaction between humidity, temperature, and also health. Mm -hmm. um, they might argue that we don't need to look at humidity as a single risk factor mm -hmm. rather than as a confound factor of temperature as well, which is quite similar. Any other questions in the room? Have we got any questions? Emma, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was struck by the 2019 figure of 1.7 million deaths worldwide linked to extreme cold and heat of which, did I understand it right, that 356,000 are related to heat. So am I right in thinking then that 1.6, more than 1.6 million deaths might actually be eased by an increase in climate temperature? If, 1 .6, if more than 1.6 million deaths are caused therefore by extreme cold, would, would an increase in temperature actually benefit those people? <laughs> I, I really don't think so. How, how, how so? <laughs> I don't know the answer. I'm not going to I really don't think so. We can we say that increase the temperature might, might ease the, the cold weather events because it might. Yes. The cold weather other, other factors as well, you know, other heating about, about the social economics data, you know, what we often call about the fuel poverty in winter. And there's lots of things to cause that cold related deaths. So flip but it's not saying that we will, we could the increase in temperature or increasing more temperature climate will help reduce the cold related deaths. It will just make it more extreme or the cold weather more extreme. I see. Oh right, okay. So I think basically you're saying there are yeah. lots of different variables involved yeah. in the cold related deaths. So it's not a simple trade-off. It's not yeah. like the scales. I think. It's yes. Bit, okay. I, th I think. It all, yeah, it often you know, more make it more even extreme cold weather. It's not to reduce this cold related okay. yeah. I have a question, but first with the extreme cold weather events, I think that the point is in the in the concept itself. There is extreme events because at least in the area that I'm studying, in the recent years, we've had an increase both in extreme heat related events and in extreme uh, cold weather events. So if we increase the mean temperature, but those extreme cold events are still happening, are happening more frequently and are happening more intensely, those wouldn't be mitigated because the mean temperature is higher. But the question is, uh, that was a very good talk. And I was interested when you spoke about the, how to reduce the health events of hot weather, as you said, the areas that are more affected are also the ones that can be more vulnerable. 
And you were referring to cooling, which, uh, sorry, air conditioning, which can be an affordable or can be costly environmentally. So do you know of any program that is being undertaken in those low and middle income countries like the reforestation of urban cities that can help them ease the mortality? I I'm not aware of any kind of study happening now in LMIC countries, I'm sorry. Um, but I think that's a really good suggestion. So we do need to look at alternative plants in terms of cooling individual mm. beyond this condition. Because a more sustainable option might be available. But I don't think it's not even in the agenda yet in those LMIC countries how to reduce the extreme heat or extreme cold or extreme weather generally. Great, any more questions? I could, talk, I could keep thinking of things, but I'm restraining myself. <laughs> any more questions? Are there any questions online at all? No. No? Okay, well, I think we'll stop the um, recording now. Uh, I should also have said at the beginning that um, Heiko, the, the uh, director of the Institute, sends his apologies, he's not able to be here today. Obviously, I'm not Heiko. <laughs> I am currently the associate director of the Institute, so that's why I was presenting him. I should have stopped at the beginning. But thank you once again for an excellent talk and what you yep. yeah, thank you.